Hello, everyone, and welcome to the International Biochar Initiative's Biochar Technology Podcast. This is uh, the very first installment, and we're lucky enough today to have Anna from ETIA and Jeff from VAU ASA to speak with us uh, about their experiences with biochar technology. So I think I'll start off uh, by asking Anna and Jeff to introduce themselves uh, and just give us a little bit of background. Absolutely. Uh, hello, Akio, and uh, thanks for having us here. First of all, I, I want to say that it's, uh, it's really surreal to be on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and to talk about the biochar because you know I'm a I'm a big listener to podcasts myself and uh, I was always thinking that there is no show that would cover what are we doing in business. So it's really fun to see that uh, we are doing something that uh, we can not only write or make a video of but uh, present to the world. And uh, big thank you first of all for for taking up this uh, initiative and uh, I hope that we are going to stand up for the challenge. Oh, I think you're doing great already. So as an introduction, uh, being very brief, uh, my name is Anna Grochowska, but it's um, easier to say just Anna. There is only one Anna in the company. I'm a material engineer by education, and I've been working with ETIA since about uh, six years now. Uh, but before I was also involved in the priorities projects uh, when I was working in Poland, this is my home country, so my journey with such a technologies has actually started 10 years ago. And eventually uh, it has led me to the BioGreen and uh, that's how I started to work with ETIA. So I joined the company in 2016 and first I was working more in um, technical functions, project management, and then slowly, step by step, I was moving towards the commercial side of things. Uh, and uh, so I became a marketing and sales director and what I'm doing now is I'm taking care about uh, rolling the biogreen technology around the world. Very good, thank you. And Jeff, what about you? I guess that's my turn. My name is Jeff Lindsay. Uh, my background is in electrical engineering, actually. Uh, I started in the marine wastewater business in 2007, and that's kind of led me on a journey uh, that first introduced me to ScanShip in, in 2011 where I came on board as a service engineer. Um, and I've been working primarily in that division for the last 10 years. In 2019, we're gonna talk later about um, the founding of VAU and the, the acquisition of ETIA. Uh, it opened an, a new door for me to, to this world of biochar, which I think is, is very exciting. Before that, I'd, I'd only heard about biochar through the occasional news article and, and press release and didn't know very much about it, but um, it very much aligns with my own passions um, and my own interests in, in both gardening and climate, fight, the fight for climate change. And uh, I, I transitioned from my role in the service department at, at Scanship over to, to our land-based business, uh, working with Anna and working with the team at ETIA and, and the team at VAU that's now uh, taking the R&D level, taking the R&D challenges to the next level to, to really roll out this technology. So. I hope that answers the question. Uh, well, thank you both uh, for that brief introduction. And now, of course, we're so interested. What is your backstory? What is it that got you interested in biochar? And how long ago was that? Well, it was already quite a while ago. Um, you know, if you look at our team, uh, Jeff already mentioned about being uh, passionate about gardening, but by the way, he's amazing expert about pyrolysis. We work together on a team and uh, he puts all his heart into that. But uh, when you look at everybody in the group, um, what actually makes us you know, wake up and uh, every morning and go to work, it's, uh, it's actually the fact that we are doing something good for the world and we are helping to reduce the carbon emissions. And that's the, the key element of uh, all the picture. So because the decarbonization is so important uh, for us as a group. Uh, we were also trying to focus on the technologies, on the solutions which can actually make the largest impact in this regard. Uh, and there we actually head to the biochar because it's a um, commodity that, uh, of course, we have known it for a long time, 
And uh, regarding your question, when did we start it? Actually, Etia has been delivering pyrolysis since 2003. So our first contact with uh, this uh, product, this commodity was already back then. But now together when we see uh, industries that are searching for a needs net zero, the biochar is actually becoming more and more important to us. So we think of it about as not only a really amazing soil improvement or functional product, but above all that, uh, it's a really, really powerful carbon sink. And this is why we decided as a group to focus so strongly on delivering technologies for biochar production. Because, you know, as, as somebody said recently, the climate change is no longer a future problem, it's a now problem. And we are here and we have to act on it. Right, John? Absolutely. Um, our core goal as a, as a group is to end waste and fight climate change. Uh, biochar ticks both of those boxes for us. We see it as a, as a catch-all solution for, for that cha those challenges. On a personal level, uh, I love growing vegetables, and I think the connection between our food system and healthy soil is incredibly important. So that's what gets me excited about biochar on a, on a very personal level. On, on the global level, I look at the climate change solution as, as the main thing that gets me, me professionally interested in what we're doing. Everybody knows, I think, that's listening to this, or I, I hope everybody who's listening to this knows uh, all the different uses of biochar, how soil amendment is, is one of those, those key areas where we can really get the best, the biggest impact out of biochar. Well, absolutely, guys. I can, uh, I can second that into, at least as far as why am I in this role right now, or what was my experience with biochar over the last 10, 12 years, and it was save the world. Um, just, it's, it feels, it's enriching. And I've, ever, I at least feel like I need to be doing something um, in that regard. However, I will say I do not have large quantities of biochar in my home garden. And I keep telling myself, I need to, I need to find a super sack that I could just dump into the garden and, uh, I don't know, maybe there'll be a little less manure shoveling at that point. Well, I was actually lucky enough to be given um, about, uh, I think it was about 10 cubic feet of biochar by one of our one of our industrial partners this year. And we put mm -hmm. it into the, we have raised beds in the backyard where we grow cucumbers, tomatoes, onions, you name it. We, whatever we can grow in this climate region, we try to grow in this climate region. And it was our best, this year was our best harvest that we've ever had. We've produced anything that we've seen in the five years that we've been doing it, our onions were fantastic. And yeah, we, we did a mix of biochar with compost. And it was absolutely incredible, the, the results we saw. Excellent. I, uh, and the scientist in me is gonna have to ask you, did you have control beds? No. I planned to have control beds, but then I got, um, I don't know if it was lazy or excited. Totally, it's just too exciting, right? Yeah. So anyway, back on track. Um, uh, could you, Jeff, could you tell me about the history of your company, Vow ASA? Sure. Um, I, I'd love to. Uh, Vow is actually a, a very new company. It was formed in 2019 to bring several leading brands together, or several brands together under uh, United Leadership. Uh, the core leadership of our company is made up of the team from Scanship, who uh, is a world leader in marine waste and wastewater treatment and has been for, for over two decades now. Um, and Etia, which Anna will say a little bit more about afterwards. Uh, Scanship's been providing waste management solutions to the cruise industry since the mid 1990s, uh, including garbage sorting, recycling, densification, incineration, food waste handling systems, the list goes on. If there's a waste product on the ship, we're trying to deal with it. Uh, we also deliver wastewater purification systems, advanced wastewater purification systems on cruise ships. So these are, these are, contained integrated systems similar to what we would see in a municipal wastewater treatment system. But instead of having two or three weeks to process the wastewater, we're doing it in 24 to 48 hours. Um, and we're, we're dealing with all the wastewater streams from a ship, which is basically a floating hotel. And we've been doing that for, for the last two decades as well. And we've become an industry leader in that, in that sector. Um, in recent years, we've also been developing uh, a new microwave-assisted technology for the marine 
industry that will replace incinerators. Uh, going down that road of pyrolysis, we started to think maybe we shouldn't limit ourselves to the cruise industry and, and this marine market, which is inherently smaller than, than the global markets that are available. And we see waste as a problem. It's not just unique to ships, it's, it's, it's everywhere in the world. So we started looking around at um, what technology was out there in the land-based sector that could use, that could maybe benefit from our, our approach to industrializing and commercializing these types of systems. And we came across Etia, who developed a biogreen technology and was already an industry leader in, in that technology. And the, the management at Scanship decided to approach Etia and partner with them. Um, so there was an acquisition by Scanship in 2019. And uh, at that time, we decided that it no longer makes sense to call ourselves Scanship. So the entity VOW was, was created to, or VOW ASA was created to, to catch all of these different brands under one leadership. And now we're, we're working together to solve problems both on the oceans and on land. Nifty. And, and where does Etia fall into this then? Well, with regards to Etia, I think we could speak a whole evening. <laughs> it's been a, actually a company that was established uh, in uh, 1989 uh, in the beautiful town of Compiègne, close to Paris. Uh, it was created by two graduates of a local university, uh, Olivier Lopez and Philippe Serge. And from the very beginning, it was uh, basically a company specialized in thermal treatment processes. So we have been always focusing in the providing high quality equipment. And that's also why we established uh, eventually the business based on the patented and uh, electrically fitted solutions. So historically speaking, the, the process that we are going to speak about that we call a spiragel, which is uh, at the heart of uh, Quite every plant we deliver, we created it already over 20 years ago. And first it was applied uh, in the food sector for low temperature treatment of uh, spices and herbs. And it was very much appreciated by the clients because it was, uh, and it is, a very precise and adjustable way of uh, treating different uh, materials. So historically, we, we have been doing uh, sterilization and the bacterization for many years. And uh, we have been uh, having uh, many good implementations across the world. So to give example, we, we've delivered over 100 uh, pyrolysis, uh, 100 uh, spiritual machines uh, for, for the food market. Uh, and soon uh, after, that we've seen that technology is doing great in food industries, we started to look about uh, around the, uh, the processing and we started to look what is happening around the industrial activity as well. So what kind of residues are produced, what kind of waste is being generated and how can we use it and how can we add uh, the value to what is uh, usually a discarded product. And by that, to make uh, even more for the customers and to make a more circular economy concept. So we eventually decided to take the spiritual uh, step further in thermal treatment. We have uh, upgraded the technology to work in the uh, air restricted conditions and in higher temperature. So in other words, uh, air restricted, high temperature, uh, you know, we, we have made the first pyrolysis plant. And that was back in 2003, and we have called the process the BioGreen. And this first machine is still up and running for almost uh, 20 years. Sorry to interject. That's amazing that your pyrolysis plant has been running for 20 years. We've been a while on this market. Uh, so that's, that's been really fun, and that has helped us to accumulate a lot of knowledge about how this process works. But fast forward to the present days. actually. Our work for delivering pyrolysis for different applications was really gathering uh, the speed over the past years. And we've been providing different uh, applications for pyrolysis for many different countries. So we delivered over 40 machines in different locations. And uh, our BioGreen has started to get a fantastic momentum and uh, great visibility on the market. We started to work with the uh, many industrial actors uh, going through a lot of exhibitions all over the world and 
that's how we met Scanship, a uh, Norwegian uh, company, and uh, that, that job has been mentioning. Uh, and that's how in 2019, so our companies have decided to join forces. And we created a, a really worldwide organization that's, uh, that is now working for both for offshore, for marine industries and for land-based industries. So ending that long, long, long history, which could be even longer, we, we are pretty much present uh, all across the world. We have a team in the Europe, in the United States, um, all uh, about uh, 150 people, a whole lot of industrial experience accumulated, uh, very, very passionate about reducing carbon footprint of industry. And uh, these days, uh, there is a whole lot to do in this regard. And would you uh, would you call that BioGreen your company's claim to fame? This is definitely our flag product. Mm, BioGreen is uh, is a product of Etia, which uh, and Val now, uh, which uh, has been on the market for over thirty years. So it's uh, our claim to fame uh, in a sense that we have uh, the technology which has a long long track record. We have accumulated a great deal of knowledge. Uh, in delivering thermal treatment solutions. There are not many actors out there who have such a long history and experience and the capacity to deliver and such a market presence. So the strength of us as a group is that we can provide uh, reliable solutions, which on top of everything offer a very strong business model and make a great climate impact. This is why this is so interesting. Absolutely. Uh, the robust industrialized system that Etia developed and, and implemented all these years is, is what interested the Scanship management team. Uh, under VOW, uh, we're, we're pouring in more engineering and development resources to, to build on the expert technology that Etia has developed to, to convert these into complete turnkey systems and solutions for our, our clients. Um, our competency as a group is really in delivering complex systems and making them successful and, and sticking with them and, until they are successful. And let me ask you, um, I'm curious about BioGreen. Um, is there, could you tell me about the range of feedstocks that you've produced BioGreen from, or is it a fairly, is it a wide range of feedstocks or are, is it geared, is the process geared more towards I don't know, single stream things like uh, forestry waste. No, I mean, we, BioGreen is a very versatile technology. Uh, it, any, any feedstock really can be put into it. We just need to tune the system. It, it needs to be a flowable feedstock. It needs to be um, an energy, a feedstock that has some energy in it. Uh, but in general, we, we're ready to talk to anyone who's got a waste feedstock. Uh, we've, We've got installations where we're processing sewage sludge. We've got installations where we're processing biomass. Plastic pyrolysis is something that we're, we're working on and, and close to breakthrough on. End of life tires is something that we've, we've done and, and are gaining core competency. And so uh, if it's a waste, we're, we're already talking about it. Very versatile. Um, and if I could ask, um, is each installation designed uniquely for the feedstock or is it that the technology itself is just so versatile? It can be a little bit of both actually. Uh, there's, a, there's a range of operation for every different system, but uh, it could be that the biogreen core itself might be the versatile, the piece that can, can handle different feedstocks and, and variability in the input. Uh, but the outputs are gonna be different. So sometimes our output systems are tuned towards certain feedstocks. You can imagine that the same gas generated from processing end of life tires is, is much different than the same gas generated from processing corn husks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and would you consider that uh, the unique advantage of your technology that it's so versatile? I think that that's really a big part of it. Um, uh, the biogreen pyrolysis process, uh, which is our, our main solution for land-based waste valorization, um, although we're always building that portfolio, so we may be ready to talk about, about more solutions in this area sometime soon. Um, but biogreen is unique in that it's a highly controllable and replicable process. Uh, we can 
consistency is in the outputs is really what our main advantage is, I would say. When we have a feedstock and we've, we've characterized that feedstock and we, we get a consistent supply of that feedstock, we can produce the same outputs every time consistently on a continuous flow basis. The biochar is going to be the same. The syngas is going to be the same. If we're extracting oils from the, from the syngas through condensation steps, the oils are going to be the same because we're controlling the, we're precisely controlling the dwell time and the temperature of the process. So I say technically that's what our main, our main advantage is. Um, we're, where it's a very precise type of pyrolysis technology, which which I think varies a little bit than some of the, the other technologies that are out there in the market. Um, I think another thing that really sets us apart, and this can sometimes be a disadvantage for us depending on the price of electricity, is that our system is electrically powered. The heat for pyrolysis comes from electricity, which is which is unique. From what I know, that's, that's unique. Not a lot of systems are doing that. Um, this can be seen as a disadvantage when electricity is expensive or when um, there's no electricity available, but it can also be an, advent, an advantage when we look at how many, how much more the world is pushing towards renewables and how much more the world is pushing to electrify and find clean sources of electricity to power equipment. We're not bringing in fossil fuels to initiate the process. We're not bringing in, we're not creating any fossil fuels through the process or emissions from the process other than the emissions from the feedstock. So we can be a truly carbon neutral at a minimum, and in most cases, carbon negative process. So I think that's, that's definitely something that we consider to be a key advantage of our, our type of technology versus some of the other ones that are out there. Jeff, you've been doing such a good job of telling us everything. I wonder if Anna might have um, something to add as regards uh, technological advantages of your particular kiln design. Thank you, uh, Akia. I think Jeff pretty much nailed it, uh, but uh, if there would be something to add in that regard, perhaps uh, it would be worth to mention that the electricity that, uh, that we spoke about, it's a technology that is powered by electricity. It also gives us uh, one more uh, additional advantage. It gives us a possibility to adjust the process temperature. Uh, according to what is the desired characteristic of biotron. So that opens the way for our clients to actually develop their own unique uh, recipe and uh, to build the parameters of the biochar according to the market demand. And that's pretty much a strength that uh, we would likely not be able to achieve with anything else than the electricity. So that's why we are so much uh, enthusiastic about using it uh, in, in the process. I like to say we are a little bit like a Tesla among the, the uh, thermal treatment processes. That's excellent. And um, as a matter of fact, I've been involved with this research, a research kiln here um, on the Cornell campus, the, the beloved Cornell pyrolysis facility, which is also electric fired. Um, I mean, sure, that was partly out of convenience also to not have to handle um, or meter syngas combustion. But uh, yes, that that is the trick for control is electric heating elements um, with thermocouples to tell you where you need the heat because every feedstock is going to heat differently, I imagine, based on the thermal mass and moisture content and so on and so forth. Um, so I suppose now, now that we're getting into the nitty gritty of this, um, would one of you like to touch on uh, throughput capacity of these units? Sure. Um, so it's kind of an interesting question. Uh, we have some very, very small systems. We have bench systems that might actually go well at your Cornell lab, and we should talk about that. Aha! <laughs> if only we had known. <laughs> I can certainly send you more information and we can talk about that. Uh, but we use our bench systems for trials and we use them for pilot studies and, and verification of process and confirming our assumptions and, and our scientific uh, notes on, on what we think is going to happen. Uh, these systems generally process up to about 10 kilograms per hour, so it's a very low throughput. Um, very small systems. Those are our little uh, BioGreen 130 systems. They come in a couple different models and, and this full, full complete systems meant for mainly for research purposes and, and study purposes. Um, from there, we go up to commercial scale, and historically, we've had a number of different sizes and systems. Um, 
the last few years, we've been trying to standardize and, and really pin down what is the what what is the size that makes sense for us to start with. And we've come to a, a system that processes about one metric ton per hour of, of dried biomass feedstock. Uh, so being a heavily industrialized system and for continuous operation, we're looking at around 7,500 tons per year of, of feedstock being processed. And the system itself is inherently modular. Uh, we, can, we can put multiple biogreen reactors in parallel and gain economies of scale on the input, of input processing and output processing. Um, so I think, uh, I think that that's where I'd like to end on that one. And I th I think that's quite impressive actually that you've um, that you have reactors ranging two orders of magnitude of throughput. Um, my understanding is that the thousand kilos an hour is roughly that's as large as you want to get uh, because you lose on economies of scale if you start scaling up from there, um, and hence the need to repeat units. But I, I think that makes perfect sense. Um, and could you comment on how many of these kilns are in operation? Before we head there, just to, to also mention regarding the maximum capacity, uh, of course, the system is uh, one uh, standardized to one ton per hour, but then we can also go for a modular uh, design and we can place the kilns uh, side by side uh, uh, by uh, reaching the, the highest, higher operation uh, throughput. So that is quite a scalable solution at the same time when we don't have to uh, limit ourselves only to this amount of 7,500 tons per year. I think that it might be interesting for your listeners to know that the largest plant that we currently have in development is, is, being, um, is being developed in, in Norway. And it's gonna be a production plant producing 10,000 metric tons per year of biocarbon. So if we're looking at a, at a 70 to 80 percent reduction in mass, you could, you could reverse the math, and, and we're looking at 40,000 tons per year of, of feedstock, roughly, that's that's being processed as as dry feedstock. If we add the moisture content to that, we could be anywhere from 80 to 100,000 tons per year of, of a wet wood feedstock. So that's that's a six line system that we're putting in. Um, it's it's in collaboration with a spin-off company, which is Valkyrie Metals, uh, which we spun off last year to address a very specific market need. And that's going to be a build and operate system uh, under, under new management and new leadership within our division. That is impressive. Just out of curiosity, what feedstock is being supplied uh, in excess of 40 tons per year? Uh, it's, uh, it's clean wood chips. The business model for Valkyrie Metals is, uh, and this is all public information available on their website, uh, they're going to be producing biocarbon uh, specifically for the metallurgic sector as a replacement for fossil coke in coking furnaces. Excellent. For steel production and, and other metal productions. Um, and the, the same gas is going to be valorized to produce hot water and steam that's going to be used in, in various different industrial processes around, around Norway. Excellent. Um, and, you know, one lingering question, um, in my mind at least, okay, research scale, biogreen kilns, 10 kilos an hour throughput, uh, commercial scale units, 1,000 kilos an hour um, throughput. What of the middle ground in between? Are there a number of options? There, uh, there used to be. <laughs> there used to be several different options from from 200 kilos an hour to, to it all the way up to 1,000 and kind of 200 kilos per hour increments. Uh, we've been standardizing because we've seen that the, the biomass wastes and the biomass demand is really orders of magnitude larger than even our biggest machine. When we're talking about biomass as a problem, we're generally talking about thousands of tons per year. Um, so we've, we've decided as a company to focus our, our engineering efforts on the larger systems and scaling those up and, and even adding new equipment upstream to, to help reduce the cost and, and increase the throughput of the systems. We do have, um, currently we're supporting one middle of the road uh, product line, which is the Biogreen 450 line, which is uh, probably, and I can correct me if I'm a little bit off here, but I think it's from about 
depending on the feedstock, it's around about 200 to 300 kilograms per hour of feedstock being processed. That's great. I mean, it, it just gets me thinking about, you know, on the one hand, you have, you have science on the one hand, and you have these large industrial operations on the other side. Um, but there are some folks in the middle. On that note, we have, um, this wasn't part of our, what we plan to talk about today, but we, we do have a, one system here in the U.S. that um, we co we're, we're going to be co-owners of. And we're looking at upgrading and improving that system so that we can actually offer toll processing as a service to, to smaller customers who maybe aren't ready to, to purchase a large industrial machine, but want to either test their feedstock, but not at a research level as a as more of a production level. They want to run 10,000 10, or 10 tons or, or something through our machine. We'll be able to, to meet that demand to help customers kind of scale up internally and, and figure out what they can do with it and make sure that their business model can work before they make a huge investment in, in technology. That's excellent. I love to hear that. Um, this option for like a, a pre-commercialization step. I could see that being very, very helpful. Um, on that note, um, I wonder, is there one particular profile, I suppose, of the best owner operator of your systems? It sounds like, no, it sounds like things are, um, that you guys are, are, are very diverse, both in the capability of the units and the size of the units. There can be many different profiles. It's, uh quite correct, if you say, but um, looking at our customers so far, we could actually try to distinguish a few uh, patterns. Uh, so I would say we have gained a lot of traction among the industrial companies, uh, which are usually both uh, handling and also disposing uh, the biogenic residues. Uh, that's the first factor. And uh, at the same time, uh, I fair to say that all of our clients are really, really motivated towards re reducing their carbon footprint, meaning they have a very strong sustainability strategies and they are having a roadmap of going to a net zero within the, the foreseeable time. Uh, and they very often, that's the second pattern, they are looking to offset uh, the natural gas, which uh, they are using on site to produce the process heat. So we talk about two different um, elements. Uh, first is availability of the feedstock, which is very close. And the uh, second is the intention to offset the natural gas or fossil fuel, which is used to produce, for example, steam or heat or hot water, hot air. So in such a profile of the company, I would say that our biogreen system is uh, really solving uh, both challenges because on one hand, it's... Uh, opens possibility to treat the residues, biomass, waste uh, on site. Then on the other hand, the same machine that produces biochar is also producing syngas that is used to offset the fossil gas uh, on site. Uh, and, uh, and such an example of um, the customers uh, and operators is something that is present in, I would say, many industries. So coming back to the profile, if we look at the commodity goods manufacturers, that uh, the chocolate industry with whom we are working, for example, uh, as we speak this week, uh, we are delivering a beautiful project uh, to uh, Hamburg, uh, to our customer Circular Carbon, and they are working together with Barry Calbo, which is producing the, the chocolate. Uh, and those guys are doing amazing work to reduce the carbon footprint of the chocolate production. They are going to process the cocoa shells uh, into the biochar, and they are going to produce the green steam, which is used in, in a chocolate production. So that would be, let's say, a, a case that uh, illustrates very well uh, where do we fit in uh, terms of the profile. So that's how it pretty much works uh, in Europe. Um, and is that, is that the same job in the US? Absolutely. Uh, we're, we're really... I wouldn't say we're targeting customers necessarily, but we're, we're looking for customers that have a need for both the, uh, or to have a feedstock that they're looking to get rid of, um, a waste material that's, that's become a problem for them in general, and are looking at process heat as an output. That's, that's a, main, a main target for us. The biochar and the biocarbon are very, very interesting 
but so is the CO2 CO2 neutral gas that we can produce from our process. Um, finding finding owners and plant operators that have a need for both waste disposal for this biogenic waste and a need for that that process heat is our it's kind of our sweet spot. Uh, that makes perfect sense. I've been thinking for years how nifty it would be to uh, overlay a map, a GIS map of all of the piles of waste stream biomass with a map of all of the industrial processes that require low grade heat um, to make the most of, of, of exactly that. Um, and of course the syngas once upgraded that can be transported. Is that also part of the, the business model? At this point in the game, uh, first of all, because of the way our, our process works by putting electricity into to create the heat that's needed for pyrolysis, um, we're able to fully harness the, the power of the syngas. We don't, we don't have to put the syngas energy back into our process to, to heat. So the full, the full power of the volatile matter converted into some gas that's available to us to produce this process heat. Um, and then from there, our preference right now, and this is always evolving, I think, as, as we get more, but this isn't just a unique problem for us, it's for all the gas producers uh, in all industries across, across the world. We're looking for ways to improve the quality of the gas and how we can do transportation. Can we methanize this to the point that it can be put into the existing natural gas grid? And there's lots of work being done on that. Um, right now, where we're at on the commercial scale is, on-site production of steam or hot water or heat in the form of hot air. Uh, hot air can be used for, for a number of different things from space heating, big buildings to drying feedstocks, um, steam, you name it. They, food and beverage, just as an example, has a massive demand for steam across the world. Uh, being able to use this on-site and co-locate facilities with, with these big steam heaters is, is important to us and it's, it's kind of what we're looking at. Um, in Sweden, we have, uh, I'll let Anna take over because I think, I think she's got something to say on this point. Well, just a little, uh, when you speak about the, um, uh, the Sengas for heat is of course something that is uh, uh, our standards and uh, we, uh, in order to, to multiply the technology and to really make a big impact, we have to standardize something. And that's why we are so much focused on the configuration where we are producing biochar and uh, heat, uh, process heat uh, at the same time. Uh, but of course, we do have a lot of R&D in the pipeline. And so we do work on the projects where we are working on uh, upgrading the syngas, uh, on uh, uh, methanation uh, on uh, uh, improving the syngas uh, up to the degree that it could actually be injected to the grid. Uh, so we do quite a lot uh, in terms of uh, R&D and in terms of the product development uh, on the topic that uh, you mentioned, Akio, in, uh, in order to be able to soon introduce the machines uh, for also doing a little bit more than that. But uh, as of today, uh, we, we are strongly focusing on what can be, let's say, the, the most interesting and available product for the market. Excellent, excellent, thank you for that. And yes, of course, there's, uh, there's much to be gained by thinking ahead. There's much uh, gains in efficiency. Um, simply from planning the co-location of these industrial processes um, and the use of, of waste stream biomass. Um, could we, if you don't mind, could we circle back around um, to the reactor itself? Um, it's electric fired and I'm, I'm curious how you get that done. Uh, I'm familiar with clamshell heaters um, surrounding, you know, a, a cylinder, a tube. It's, it's actually quite a simple, simple process uh, or a simple concept. Uh, it's a continuous feed system. Mm -hmm with a heated screw conveyor. Um, we use the, the screw itself to provide the heat to the product. So we, uh, we keep the air or oxygen, which is the most important part here, out of the process. Um, 
through an infeed system. Uh, it's a closed infeed system with a series of screw conveyors uh, that prevent excess air and oxygen from entering the reactor. Uh, we also have a purging system to purge with nitrogen or other inert gas to make sure that we don't have any oxygen in the reactor when the feedstock comes in that prevents any, any combustion from, from taking place inside the, the reactor. Um, this creates this oxygen-free environment that we need for, for pyrolysis to really start happening and, and take place. Um, it's a shaftless screw conveyor, so it's a hollow, hollow shaft screw. Um, made entirely of a of stainless steel. Uh, the larger systems have about a, a 750 millimeter diameter on the screw, uh, outer diameter on the screw. Um, and it's heated by passing a low voltage electric current through it. Um, so that can be quite a challenging part of the process. There's a lot of engineering that goes into that. Are you telling me that the screw itself is a resistive heating element? Absolutely. Wild. That's, that's the, the core of our, our technology. So this is the same as how a, an electric radiator works, um, but we're using the screw itself as the, radi as the element. Um, this form of heating is probably known to a lot of people as the Joule effect. So hence, spirit Joule. Um, that's, where the, that's where the name came from for the, the core element in the biogreen reactor and the safe sterile, um, sterilization units. I was wondering what Anna was saying earlier. Thank you for clarifying that. That's great. Because the screw itself is heated, we're allowed to directly, we're enabled to directly transfer heat to the product. Um, so we're not heating the gas necessarily around the product. We're actually passing heat directly from the metal screw to the product. Um, this keeps a consistent a consistent transfer of heat to the product at all times, and it allows for a uh, loss for the product to be heated through. So if we've got a screw, for example, that's 60% full, if you're heating that with hot gas, you don't necessarily get an even heat transfer from the top layer of the, of the feedstock down to the bottom layer of the feedstock. But with our, with our technology, because the screw itself is, is moving the product down, there's constant contact with the, of the product with the screw all throughout the product. So we're, allowed, we're enabled to, to accurately transfer heat to the product. Um, more about the, just the architecture, I guess, uh, sand gas is extracted by keeping the reactor a slight vacuum. Um, I say slight, uh, that's, that's always changing every day too. We're developing a better understanding, I think, of, of how efficiently we need to remove sand gas to, to control the quality of the biochar and, and make sure that we're not wasting energy or wasting heat. So we're always, we're always building this the concept and the understanding of how everything is working. Um, the heating, electric heating, as we've talked about before, and as you've mentioned, is, is it's a fantastic way to control the amount of heat you're, you're providing to the product. Um, we can, we're measuring the temperature of the reactor itself. We're measuring the temperature of the product in the reactor. If it starts to drop, if it starts to change, in the reactor, we, we get the feedback immediately and we can adjust how much electricity we're providing to the screw. So we can precisely control the heat transfer to the product. Um, typically, we can operate anywhere from 300 to 800 degrees Celsius in a, in a normal biogreen reactor. Uh, we do have some R&D that's looking at going up to higher temperatures, which is, which is interesting for feedstocks such as plastics, where we're looking at actually getting into thermal cracking of the, of the sink gas to recover carbon black. So this, this could be something very interesting in the future. Uh, the other advantage we talked about with our system is that it's a, it's a screw conveyor. So a screw conveyor allows us to calibrate and control how long the product is staying within the reactor, which allows us to adjust, as you can imagine, it allows us to adjust and control the process. Could you, could you comment offhand on the, I don't know, the range of residence time particle residence time inside the kiln? Absolutely, it depends on the size of the kiln, depends on the customer's requirements. Um, what are the goals of the project? What are the goals of the outputs? Um, we control the speed of the screw via frequency drive. So we can usually, within the range of the gearbox and the torque availability, we can control from 15 to 40 minutes, 45 minutes. But in specialty cases, because this is just a matter of of frequency provided to the motor and the gear ratios to make sure you have the torque set correctly. We could 
specifically calibrate this if a customer happened to need a two hour residence time for some very special project, it wouldn't be a problem. We could, we could adjust the speed of the screw for that. Um, and a point of curiosity, how full is the tube with the screw filled? You're looking at this, I imagine it's a horizontal screw or is it a vertical screw? It's a horizontal screw that is actually lying in, um, in the horizontal auger. So you probably refer to what we call a filling rate, meaning the level of the product. So typically are running uh, the operation uh, and the level of the product below the hollow shaft. Um, that's, the, that's where the product is uh, at, the, at its highest level. So it's, it's end up below the hollow shaft of the screw because we are really aiming to control the flow and the residence time that Jeff was mentioning before. Uh, very often, if that would be above the hollow shaft, then some single, single particles of the product, they could be uh, in a backflow. And that would mean that we don't actually control very accurately uh, the, the residence times in the pyrolysis chamber. And that we want to avoid. I see. It's about the tumbling of the feedstock particles. We're, can, we're using the screw to convey them down. Um, so if we have, because it's a hollow shaft, if we're above the, the rim of the shaft, the product will just fall back. It won't be conveyed down the screw. Um, but it's also important to, to keep in mind that as we're pyrolyzing, we have mass reduction. Um, so a typical biomass feedstock will come in at 100% mass. And by the time it exits the reactor four to, to 10 meters later, it's lost in, in terms of solid mass, it's lost 70% to volatilization of the syngas. So we're down to 30% mass and, and then our volume has also decreased considerably throughout that process. And I, there are a million questions that I would like to ask, but I'm willing to bet that some of these are proprietary information. So uh, I think I skipped that for now. We got the gist of it, which is great. It's a heated screw that blows my mind that you have um, a structural, well, a moving part that is also the heater. Um, very quickly, is it just one heating element, just one heating zone for the, for the screw? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that would just be getting far too complicated, I imagine. If I may add, uh, very often we are working with the sequence uh, so we can use several screws one uh, and then another on the downstream. So we can actually create a setup where there are different levels of treatment. Ah, so, so not too complicated, not for you guys. That's great. So now that we have uh, an understanding of this, in my opinion, very unique reactor architecture, this heated screw, um, I wonder if one of you would like to summarize what is the fate of your syngas? It's a really good question. Uh, it really depends on it depends on on what we're doing, what the feedstock is, and and how how much we're pyrolyzing, and how much syngas is going to be, and what the composition is going to look like. We're always working on new ways to valorize this in gas. We see this as a, as a huge opportunity that if not, if not converted into something useful, it's just wasted. So we've got research and development working on electricity generation by putting cleans in gas through CHP engines. We also have uh, molecule recovery as, as something that we're working on, methanization of, of this in gas so that it can be injected into grids. Uh, chemical recycling of plastics. So we're actually creating a, uh, we're creating products that can be used to make new plastics instead of just recycling old plastics. We're, we're actually gathering the molecules and, and the chemicals that are needed to, to form new plastics at the, at, back to food grade and back to full grade plastics. Um, but those are the things we're doing, we're looking at doing in the future. That's that's the vision we have for, for where we can go with this, is, is converting syngas into all these different commodities that are gonna serve serve different markets and, and really serve the, the green economy going forward. Today, our systems are very much focused on converting syngas into industrial heat and process heat streams. Uh, we'd like to focus mostly on combustion into and using the, the hot fumes to 
produce hot air, which can be used for space heating and used for, for drying purposes and, and really any other application that requires hot air. Uh, we can produce steam, um, which can be fed back into industrial processes. Uh, and I think we mentioned earlier that almost every industrial process out there in the world is using steam in some form right now. So we can, we can convert the sink gas into steam. And then hot water is obviously just a, a lower temperature version of, of steam and we produce hot water and we have actually a, an interesting plant going up in, in Sweden where they're going to be converting yard and garden waste into biochar that's going to be going back to the communities and going into gardens and uh, restoration sites within the community where the, the yard and garden waste came from in the first place and they're producing hot water which is being injected into the district heating grid so homes are being actually provided with hot water coming from their own yard and garden waste, which is just the epitome of a circular economy. That is magnificent. I really like to hear that. On that note, uh, it sounds like, at least with that latest example, where you're collecting garden waste and pyrolyzing it locally and feeding heat back into whatever building heating system, if I have that correct, um, that must be very local. Of course, you're not gonna be piping hot water any sort of distances because you're gonna lose the heat. I wonder, um, are there restrictions uh, potentially to locating your units or are they engineered in such a way that they are fully enclosed, no nasty outputs, perfectly located downtown, so to speak? Well, it's it's very individual to location as, um, as just mentioned before. Uh, we are equipment that is producing uh, combustible gas, of course, apart from the other products. So, so we are industrial uh, solution and so, and that naturally goes together with the fact that for every plant that we are delivering, uh, we have to very carefully carry the analysis of the risk and the potential hazards inside, because we have to make sure that uh, the plant uh, is in the building or outside the building, uh, where all the environment can ensure the safety on site, where we will have no risk to, to the process operation, where we will have no power cutoffs, uh, uh, and uh, and it's uh, everything that goes together with industrial size machinery that that has to be implemented as such. But um, overall, we are working with many industries. So we work, of course, as I mentioned, with the food sector. But we also work with um, and implement pyrolysis in the plants for uh, commodity goods production. Uh, we work with um, waste management sectors, with the metallurgy. Uh, even with uh, oil and gas. So uh, that also shows that our group has uh, a lot of experience with implementing technologies uh, in a very unusual and sometimes uh, small and sometimes quite tricky spaces. Uh, for example, we, we are working to implement technologies on board of uh, cruise ships. So all in all, we, um, we do not have a general restrictions where the pyrolysis should not be, but uh, it's worth to mention that uh, Every project has to have the has to be approached with a lot of attention towards the safety. And uh, Job has been a part of this process for for many years working in scanship. So perhaps you can also add a few more words here. Yeah, uh, I completely agree with Anna here. Uh, safety has to be paramount, and uh, we've definitely had our share of tricky installations where we have to fit the equipment into to tight spaces. Um, the outputs of our process are, are very well known uh, even before the, this, the, we go into the coding stage. We know what the customer is sending us in terms of feedstock, what the process conditions are going to be, and we can very, very quickly estimate what the, what the sink gas amount is going to be if we're collecting any oil, what the oil is going to look like, and what kind of volumes we're going to be talking about, and what the, what the biotra is going to be. Um, because it's an electrically heated process, we're not producing emissions from the heating process. Uh, so that, that part of it, we don't have to worry about emissions. But there is still emissions coming from the same gas combustion chamber or boiler um, from the burner. And this is an area that we're, we're working on ourselves, but we're also looking forward to the work that's being done right now by the EPA to classify pyrolysis and gasification technologies uh, separately or in a, in a more specific way than it's currently being done. Uh, I think we fall right now under the Clean Air Act uh, as, a, as waste incinerators. And 
we think that this needs to change and I think there's a lot of momentum. I think there was an RFI that just was submitted on November 8th, uh, looking at this specifically. Generally, from our perspective, emissions are the only major environmental output that we have from our systems. We don't, if, if we do have oil, we make sure that our customers have a plan for the oil, this, either a business plan or at least a disposal plan for the oil beforehand. We don't want to be having oil stored in containers on a, on a site and then have the site go derelict and that oil seep into the environment. That's, we want nothing to do with projects like that. Um, so any, any outputs in, in terms of oil will need to be planned before the project even breaks ground. So emissions really are the only thing that's left. And we don't, we don't necessarily have all of the, all of the specifics on what emission controls need to be today. But we know that emission control technologies exist and the existing emission control technologies that are used in current industrial applications, natural gas, coal, power production, these technologies can be adapted to clean flue gas from syngas combustion without, without much difficulty. So it's really about the industry coming together and figuring out what the limits need to be. And then we can apply the correct technologies to meet those limits. So this varies, the EPA restrictions vary from, from site to site, from state to state, even within states, zoning and restrictions are different from place to place. So I would say that when we're looking at restrictions, um, the only one that, that comes to me is making sure that the customer and, and VOW are looking at the emission profiles and the emission requirements for whatever site this is going to be put in. And that can affect the cost. If we want to put it downtown in a big city, the emission requirements are going to be much more strict than if we put it out in the green field somewhere. So in essence, uh, just like with everything, it depends, but you're fully uh, prepared and committed to providing a designed and engineered package. Exactly. And now I might ask, I know we touched on feedstocks and how your systems are imminently flexible. Uh, I'm curious if there are any feedstocks that the biogreen reactor is best suited to? Uh, there might be. Well, on, on technical level, of course, as we said already, the solution is quite versatile. So if we would be looking at it from technology standpoint, we could only say there are so gro some ground rules, like uh, it has to be free flowing, it has to be free of metals, free of stones, standardized in size. Uh, but of course, as you say, I feel the, at the end of the day, there are some fixed stuff that uh, could be more preferable and uh, others that could be less of a preference because it all depends on uh, the added value of the process and what's the business model of the customer. So to give you an example, to produce a very high quality biochar, we often need to work uh, on the uh, very good quality and homogeneous feedstock. And um, uh, we would say that for business case that relies uh, very strongly on the carbon sequestration, and production of a green process heat, uh, then we should look at the feedstocks which are having relatively low ash content because ash is something that would not be converted into energy uh, and uh, high fixed carbon because fixed carbon is something that's gonna be locked uh, in the char and it will give us this beautiful carbon sequestration. But overall, there is no simple uh, universal recipe that we have to always keep because sometimes the clients are working on the business model where they are avoiding the waste. So it's uh, also uh, an, an income or saving of the costs if they are treating it uh, locally on site. And then they can afford the lower quality of the outputs uh, while some other customers are actually acquiring the biomass and paying, paying for them for the biomass. Uh, and there, the, the price of biochar has to compensate uh, uh, the cost of the biomass acquisition. Um, so eventually, the, the truth is that all of our customers over time, they, they develop uh, their own processing formulas that are actually making uh, this most attractive uh, for the off-take off -take markets. And uh, for us, uh, our optics uh, and the goal as an equipment provider is more to 
deliver them a solution that uh, allows the flexibility so they can adjust the temperature of operation and they can actually navigate the treatment uh, according to what are their expectations uh, towards the final product. And that's the core uh, technology. And so again, I'll summarize that uh, by saying that it depends, but of course it does. Um, and I think you bring up a very a valid point that, um, I don't know, it's, I suppose this is new to me, maybe that's just because of my background uh, with more on the research side of things, but yes, to be able to make the best business case, there are different things that need to be uh, taken into account than, you know, simply how to make the most stable char. You know, my uh, my French colleagues, because we are a French company, they, they love to use the comparison, uh, which is maybe not so much engineering. They say it's uh, like a cooking machine. You can put uh, uh, a lot of different materials inside and you can adjust the operating conditions and then you can cook different meals. So if you have a beef, you can have a beef bourguignon, but you can also make a steak or you can make so many different things. And it depends what are you willing to sell at the end. And the strength of the solution is not that it produces one and only biochar. It, it allows to produce the biochar as it is required by the customer. And on the feedstock note, we mentioned before the feedstock needs to flow reasonably uniform particle size. I'm curious, is this, uh, would this be the responsibility of the customer or are you also providing feedstock, particle size reduction, and drying hardware on the front end of these of these kilns? Well, since uh, since you brought it up, well, I'll say it now too. It depends. <laughs> of course, uh, it, we 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 have partners. We have technologies that we've evaluated for drying, for uh, for shredding, and, and getting the particle sizes that we need. We're working with uh, companies that do pelletizing in Europe and expanding that into the US market. So for feedstock preparation, um, we want to be a turnkey system supplier so we can supply those, those elements if that's what the customer wants, including storage, conveyance, all of it. But some customers prefer to do this part of it themselves. They prefer to say, well, we're going to provide you with, with the feedstock at this specification, and we just want you to supply the pyrolysis reactor and the same gas management downstream. And we say, no problem. So we can do we can do it all, or we can do just a portion of it, but we prefer to do it all. And I mean, in that regard, um, if you're providing the entire system, I imagine that there's uh, the due diligence is on the part of VAU ASA or ETIA to do the engineering. Um, and there will be some guarantees, um, warranties, whatever you want to call it, um, which makes me curious, uh, what about cold commissioning, hot commissioning, post-installation, post-commissioning um, support? Yeah, I mean, in short, uh, we're, we've been successful in the cruise market because we, we stand by our systems. We stand by our customers through commissioning, through delivery, through operation, for, for services for years to come after. Um, it's a core part of our, our business model. It's a core part of our culture as a company. So uh, a typical project will have a factory acceptance testing phase, usually where the equipment is being built, and then a site acceptance test where we'll test the process. But it doesn't end there for us. Um, we're, we're sticking with the customers to make sure the systems are operating. Our, our goal is is not necessarily just to sell equipment. We want to have systems in the world that are working and doing a job, the, the, the job that they were intended to do, and that the customers are satisfied and happy with them. We're trying to solve a climate problem, not just sell systems. Very good. And I'm sure this is another it depends, but it's worth asking anyway. Could you ballpark runtime or staffing requirements? Well, typically, to give you an example, uh, when when watching the industrial process on site, uh, you will basically see that uh, what the operators are doing is pretty much the supervision. So the biogreen itself is fully automated process. Uh, and uh, what we are recommending is that uh, there is an operator that uh, would uh, be on site in order to intervene and in order to be able to visually check what's happening uh, with the machine, if there is uh, any alarm. 
Uh, and that's of course refers to the biogreen as, as the core of the process. Then uh, we've been talking about the upstream and downstream and that can concern the feeding, the storage, the biotour packaging, all the manipulation of the feedstock on site. So of course, when we uh, look at the, the whole uh, facility for production, producing the biochar, it can be uh, either requiring a very limited amount of operators and staff because it's fully automated and the storage and buffers are large enough that there is no intervention needed at all. Uh, but sometimes the clients uh, which are uh, performing a smaller operation, they, they choose uh, that uh, they uh, are involving some staff in order to, for example, change the big bag. So the, the, the whole point to summarize is that the process as the heart of the process is fully automatized, that the upstream and downstream, depending on how it is solved, it might require some operators uh, on site that will do uh, manipulation, such as changing the big bags. Generally speaking, we, it's, a, it's meant to be, the biogreen's meant to be run 24 seven um, for as many days in the year as the customer is willing to run it for. Um, we generally specify 7,500 hours per year of operation, you know, a few weeks of maintenance required. Um, so that's, we need, any facility is going to need to have around the clock staff to, to manage the system and monitor the system. It's, it's uh, as Anna said perfectly, it's a highly automated system. So the staffing requirements are not very intensive. Right, but more depending on packaging of the product and whatever feedstock processing might be required on the front end. Even the packaging systems that we supply, uh, I think the largest one that I've seen is nine, it's a nine station biochar uh, bagging system. So it's, it's not that we need to stop the process and change the bag every time it's full. It's an automatic changeover from full bag to full bag or full container to the next one, to the next one, the next one. So maybe once per day, the operators need to switch out the containers or the bags, uh, but it's not a continuous on-demand. We need a forklift driver still on standby constantly for, for the process. Right, right. Very good. And ah, yes, we have the million-dollar question. What about carbon credits? I imagine some of these systems are already registered with the different accreditation agencies. What we can say for sure is that the system has uh, been proven to produce the biochar according to the uh, international standards, such as uh, IBC or IBI standards, uh, which is, of course, a quite important element for the carbon credits. Uh, so some of our clients are already certified. And uh, when it comes to uh, generating carbon credit itself, uh, I know that uh, a few plants that we have delivered and the customers who are the operators, they they have already uh, applied for this certification and they are now exploring the possibilities uh, related to the carbon credit market because this is a, a big thing in the industry. But um, this is probably more uh, their story to tell in that regard and how do they perform that operation. Going back to the electricity again of our, of our system, is, as long as the electricity coming into the system is clean, um, we don't have... A, we don't really have a, a carbon demand or a carbon output of the, of the system from fossil fuels. So it allows us to be on the kind of leading edge with, with carbon sequestration for the, uh, the biochar. So we don't have to take away any of the, the potential sequestered carbon because we've been burning fossil fuels or we've been, we've been uh, transporting hundreds of miles the, the feedstock in advance. In advance. It gives us a an advantage and we've been we've been told that um, Anna you can correct me if I'm, I'm getting this a little bit a little bit off here but uh, we've been told that as long as electricity from our systems is being supplied from renewable energy for a carbon negative technology okay well now that we have what I believe is a thorough understanding of the pyrolysis technology packages from Val ASA I would like to ask the oh so important question, what first steps should someone take if they're interested in engaging in pyrolysis reactor design and purchase? Yeah, and the first thing to do is to get in touch with us by email or through the website. Uh, every project, every system, every feedstock, every output desire is, is different and is uniquely looked at by our team. 
So get in touch with us. We have teams in the US, we have teams in Europe, and we're always we're always ready to engage and discuss our technology and whether it's a good fit for the application that the customer has in mind. And we're also willing to look at the feedstock that the customer has in mind and maybe come up with some creative solutions that the customer hasn't thought of for how we can go to market with, with this feedstock. Um, maybe the customer is looking to make biochar, but they maybe have a better market making a higher grade biocarbon. Um, so we're always trying to develop the, the concept with the customer. If, if the first idea doesn't work, we are creatively looking for other ways that will work because really we want to solve that waste problem. Very good. And on that note, um, let me summarize what I've retained in my brain. Val ASA is the company that produces the biogreen reactors that utilize what they're what they've trademarked as the Aspira Jewel technology, which is an electrically heated screw uh, that can bring the feedstock up to anywhere between 300 and 800 degrees Celsius. Residence times ranging from 15 to 45 minutes. Of course, everything is design specific. Um, there is also the possibility for feedstock drying and milling equipment on the front end and biochar packaging equipment on the back end. Is there anything I'm missing, Anna or Jeff? Well, I could just add on the general notes and perhaps on the ending notes. Uh, it's really quite exciting time to be on the market because we really watch the industry going green and uh, uh, on the practical level, we are so happy because we're just starting several projects for large industrial customers. And, and to mention some names because... Uh, uh, it uh, might be important. Uh, I already spoke about circular carbon together with factory of chocolate, Barry Calvo in Hamburg, but we are also delivering to company uh, Philip Morris International in, uh, in, to, to help them with the same business model. We are working with the uh, NSR, which is a large Swedish waste management company. So all those projects are now happening uh, on the market and those projects are including biogreen and uh, they are showing that the concept of producing biochar and heat at the same time to decarbonize industry is really getting a fantastic momentum in, in, the, in the market. So that is, of course, just the start and just as an example, but we are working very hard and we are really looking forward to do much more than that since uh, the time is going to be really, really exciting. All right. So on that note, I want to thank both of you so very much for joining us and taking the time today. I learned quite a bit and I will be sure to include your contact information in the link just below the podcast. And uh, on that note, thanks for being part of the solution. You take care, guys. Thank you very much, Akio. Really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Akio, for doing a fantastic job. <laughs>